I never thought I'd be the guy scrolling through Tinder, the online dating app known for its casual hookups and fleeting romances. But as I swiped through countless profiles, a knot of anxiety tightened in my chest. It wasn't love or lust that drove me there. It was suspicion. My girlfriend Emily had a checkered past. She'd been open about her history of infidelity, claiming to have changed her ways. But lately her behavior had become distant and evasive. The late-night texts, the unexplained absences, the subtle shift in her demeanor, they all whispered of a secret she was hiding. A notification popped up on my screen, a message from a potential match. I barely glanced at it, my focus solely on finding any trace of Emily's digital footprint. Days turned into nights, and I found nothing. Emily remained faithful, at least digitally. But my doubts lingered. In a desperate bid for clarity, I installed a hidden camera before informing her about an upcoming business trip. A sliver of hope emerged within me. Perhaps the distance and surveillance would reveal her true intentions. To my surprise, Emily insisted on accompanying me, promising a romantic getaway. But M, I stammered, trying to mask my disappointment. It's a business trip. It's going to be all meetings and presentations. Exactly, she chirped her eyes sparkling with mischief. We can make it a sexy business trip. You know, work hard, play harder. Her words were a balm to my wounded ego. Perhaps my doubts were unfounded. Maybe she genuinely wanted to be with me. I pushed my suspicions aside and embraced the idea of a romantic escape. But as the days unfolded, a familiar unease crept back in. Emily spent most of her time alone, claiming she preferred to relax at the hotel while I attended meetings. Why don't you come with me to the conference dinner tonight? I asked one evening. Oh, honey, she sighed, running a hand through her hair. You know those things are so boring. I'd rather just order room service and watch a movie. The next day, as I got ready for the premiere of a new sci-fi movie, I turned to Emily with a hopeful smile. Want to come with me? I know it's not your favorite genre, but it could be fun. She shook her head gently, her eyes filled with what I mistook for understanding. You know I'm not into science fiction, babe. It's one of your favorites, so why don't you go and enjoy it? Disappointment washed over me, but I shrugged it off, giving her a quick kiss before heading out. As I reached the lobby, a text notification chimed from Emily's forgotten phone. It was from Alex, and the message sent a chill down my spine. Can't wait to see you tonight. My heart hammered in my chest. Alex. The name resonated with a painful familiarity. I remembered Emily mentioning an ex-boyfriend from this very town. Could it be him? Fueled by a sickening blend of anger and dread, I abandoned my movie plans. Instead, I waited in the shadows of the parking garage, watching the hotel entrance. After a few agonizing minutes, Emily emerged, her face flushed with anticipation. She got into a car that pulled up moments later, and I followed discreetly. They drove to a seedy motel on the outskirts of town. I watched as they disappeared into a room, their laughter echoing in the desolate parking lot. The urge to confront them was overwhelming, but I knew it would only lead to a scene, possibly even violence. Instead, I found myself drawn to a dimly lit bar across the street. As I numbed my pain with whiskey, a notification popped up on my phone. A message from Tinder. It was the same woman who had messaged me before, in my despair, a twisted thought took root. If Emily could cheat, why couldn't I? With a trembling hand, I looked closer at the profile. Her name was Ruth, and with a surge of reckless abandon, I typed a reply. Hey, Ruth, wanna grab a drink? The seed of revenge had been sown, and a dangerous game was about to begin. But she declined my invitation politely. There was no bio on Ruth's profile, only pictures, and I figured she was way out of my league. Besides, cheating isn't as easy as it sounds. After a minute or so, she texted me back, asking if I wanted to come over to her place. Straight away, that was a red flag. She could be anyone, a hairy biker dude, or maybe some psycho. So I thought about it and texted her back. Why don't we meet up at a bar first? Then we can decide how to spend the rest of the night. I was sure she wouldn't agree, but to my surprise, she said okay. Ruth looked like a Greek goddess in her thigh-high skirt and trench coat, she had stunning onyx eyes and seemed to glow in the dimly lit pub. Every time she tossed her hair, 
The other patrons stole glances at her through the bar mirror. She looked different from the photos, sure, but still leagues above me. I went for a hug, which she redirected into a firm handshake. Ruth wore thick winter gloves, even though the fireplace in the corner was roaring. As I caught a trace of her fresh, lovely scent, a sensible voice at the back of my mind screamed, What's the catch? Surely any second now she'd trick me into emptying my bank account. Crap, maybe she'd already swiped my credit card. I patted my pockets. Wallet, phone, Pokemon keychain. Nope. All there. The bartender took our orders. I asked for a pint of Guinness, whereas Ruth stuck with tap water. Then we eased into a conversation about our lives. When I started telling her about my life in IT, she yawned sarcastically. Chuckling, I said, Well, what do you do then? I'm between jobs. And between what and what? Between surgeon and anything that doesn't involve bodily fluids. Huh. I thought they might have warned you about those in medical school. I didn't always have a problem with them. There was a traumatizing experience. She shuddered as if reliving a painful memory. Anyway, let's talk about your sex life. Caught off guard, I spat a mouthful of Guinness all over the counter. An agitated Ruth grabbed a wet wipe from her pocket, cleared the mess, and then readjusted the placemats and ashtray so everything aligned perfectly. The ginger bartender side-eyed her but said nothing. The beautiful brunette told me she had a bunch of kinks and I'd be lying if I said my heart didn't flutter a little. She asked whether I was ready for another drink. I was, although I took small, steady sips, because I never could handle my alcohol. Any more than four pints usually resulted in me clinging onto the toilet bowl like a life raft. Finally, I just came out with what was nagging at me. Ruth, don't take this the wrong way. But are you real? Like, what's the catch here? Am I going to wake up tomorrow missing a kidney? That made her chuckle. I'll be honest, there is a catch. I'll tell you if you promise not to make fun of me. I crossed my heart. She leaned close, pushed her pouty lips right up against my ear and said, I'm a clean freak, like a major clean freak. If you come back to my place tonight, I need you to wash yourself the second we get there. As her gloved finger ran along my shirt collar, she fought the urge to retch. Those clothes will need cleaning too. I've got a fresh pair you can borrow, and you must brush your teeth. Also, do you have an earwax remover with you? If not, you can borrow one from my emergency kit. I asked if she was serious. Deadly, I absolutely cannot stand filth. I need you spotless. Sound good? It felt like a winning lottery ticket had blown into my hand. I finished my pint in one long gulp, wiped away my foam moustache and said, Sounds great. In the front seat of her Volvo, Ruth handed me a breath mint, probably because a trace of my aunt's famous cottage pie lingered on my breath. She drove west out of town, toward an ultra-modern house standing against the forest. The straight angles of the white building looked odd, juxtaposed against the pine trees, and there was an angular barrier around back, keeping the vermin at bay. The sterile stench of disinfectant stung my nostrils the second we stepped through the front door. Everything was meticulously organized, all straight lines and spotless, like something from an Ikea catalogue. You could have performed open-heart surgery in any room. There wasn't a single piece of furniture not covered in plastic, and two stuffed kittens batting invisible strings stood guard in the downstairs landing. Aren't they cute? Ruth asked when she noticed me staring. It's like she occupied an alternative, shrink-wrapped universe. She made me kick off my shoes, then I followed her to the end of the hall. Standing in the middle of the bathroom, she watched as I stripped off. Her neutral expression stung. She grabbed my clothes into a ziplocked bag, which she held away from herself like radioactive waste, and then she provided clear instructions about which soap and shampoo I needed to use. I bit down on the temptation to tell her I'd been washing myself for years, sarcasm is probably what kept me single for so long, and stepped into the shower. Ruth left a white linen shirt and a pair of jeans folded neatly over the towel rack. The earwax remover on the edge of the sink operated like something out of Star Trek. I figured out the settings eventually, though. In the lounge, she handed me a shot of something fruity and sour. We clinked glasses and drank. The liquid burned on the way down. I went to sit on the sofa, but the plastic made it slicker than a water slide. I fell to the ground, and before I could pick myself up, my head got heavy and the air became stale. 
What happened next is a blur. One minute the ground was shifting beneath my feet. Next I was flat on my back. My legs were stuck. Alcohol was sloshing around the pit of my stomach, and breathing was borderline impossible. I made myself look down, a surprisingly difficult process. Past the end of the bed, Ruth rose into view, a mean-spirited grin on her face. She was encasing my legs with shrink wrap like an Egyptian mummy, gradually working her way north. I opened my mouth, no words came out. Shh, this won't take long, she said. She swung her leg over my midsection, straddling me. Then she leaned forward and pushed her lips against my ear. Don't worry, I'm going to take care of you. You look so handsome, all lovely and spotless, I'm just making sure you stay that way. Forever. Her tongue probed the inside of my ear, and then she went to fetch medical equipment from the corner of the room. My brain couldn't piece the mess together, but I knew I needed to get out of there. Fast. I tried flexing my leg muscles, but lacked the strength. Ruth's arms clamped tight around my ankles. Stop, you're messing everything up. With all the energy I could summon, I thrashed from side to side until I fell off the bed. The wooden floor hit worse than concrete. I opened my mouth to groan, but instead a great flood of vomit shot out as if launched by a supercharged sprinkler. Chunks of cottage pie flew in every direction, a fountain of half-digested beef mince, onions, carrots and garlic. Ruth rushed over to restrain me, but I rolled away, and as I did, her shoes skidded through the rancid contents of my stomach and she fell. The germaphobe popped right back up. She looked at her palms, then the wet patches all down her back, and then her throat made this strangled sound like a cat hacking up a furball. She grabbed a set of wet wipes and started scrubbing herself clean furiously. Sensing an opportunity to escape, I crawled away like a worm, leaving behind a snail trail of barf. Get back here, Ruth screamed. She physically couldn't stop scrubbing her hands long enough to come after me. I crawled down the hall around a bend. At one point I needed to use the crown of my head to force a door open. The entire time I was coughing, trying to keep that morning's breakfast from creeping up in my throat. Soon I was conscious enough to realize my left arm was free, whereas the right was pinned against my torso. To my left was the kitchen. Maybe there was a sharp object there I could cut the shrink wrap with. I fumbled towards a central island, crawled up the side and pulled on a drawer. Cutlery fell all around me with a series of metal clangs, followed by the drawer. My free hand dug through the pile for a knife, finding only spoons. Finally I grabbed a fork and stabbed at the wrap until my other arm came free. I was like a butterfly emerging from its cocoon. Footsteps came shuffling toward the kitchen. Freeing my legs would take way too long, they still only had a few inches of wiggle room. I would be at Ruth's mercy. Just then, something rancid slid up my throat, so I opened my mouth and spat a fat, sticky oyster of what had once been scrambled eggs and bacon, but now looked like an alien life form into my palm. The beautiful psycho burst through the door. In her hand was a syringe. She launched herself on top of me. My left hand caught her forearm at the last possible second, while the right smeared my biological weapon across her face. As the vomit omelette dripped from her cheek in fat glops, she released the needle and went into furious convulsions. Quickly, I rolled on top of her, grabbed the fallen drawer, and bashed her across the side of the skull. I did this until her eyes rolled back, then I crawled away on my elbows. In the hall there was a phone on top of a side table. I punched in 999. The operator couldn't understand me but sent a squad car anyway. I remember telling myself to stay awake in case my kidnapper recovered, but here my memory jump cuts to a circle of emergency responders staring down at me. The officers had a hard time believing my story. A concussed Ruth said I went crazy and attacked her. On the way to the station, they took us to the hospital to patch up our cuts and bruises. Despite being the victim, I was wrongly perceived as the aggressor, leading to me becoming the suspect. Back at the hotel, Emily was waiting in the lobby. Her eyes widened in shock as she saw me approach, bruises marking my face and arms, a physical testament to the nightmare I had barely escaped. Oh my God, what happened to you? She gasped, rushing over to me. I took my revenge on you, I replied coldly, watching as confusion spread across her face. What do you mean? She asked, her voice trembling. I know about Alex, I said, my gaze unwavering. I followed you to the motel. She must have thought that I had gotten into a fight with him, so she asked, 
I hope you haven't done anything crazy. What do you mean by crazy? I shot back. But you haven't killed Alex or something, have you? I couldn't believe her response. Oh my God, Emily, I'm telling you that I saw you guys together at a motel and you're more worried about Alex than the fact that I found out you've been cheating on me. I was furious. No, honey, I'm sorry if it came out that way. I'm just worried you put yourself in danger. I'm worried about you, not Alex, she said, her tone serious, which threw me off a bit. Yeah, like I can trust you on this one. It's your ex, Alex. You must be worried about him, I stated. What Alex? Oh, he's not the Alex, my ex. Apparently he faked his name just like I did, she said, confusing me even more. What do you mean by just like I did, I demanded. I want to know everything, right now. Okay, but you need to believe me when I say I love you because I do. And I'm truly sorry, she said, looking earnestly into my eyes. I kept staring at her, letting her know she better start talking. Well, I'm on Tinder with a fake name and fake pictures. Apparently this Alex guy did the same. He told me he's married after we slept together. Hearing this from her made me feel sick to my stomach. Okay, stop. I don't need to hear every detail, I said, trying to control my anger. Man! Honey, I just hope you didn't get into trouble with him. He's a cop, she added. The revelation that Alex was a married police officer sparked a flurry of thoughts in my mind. A spark of hope ignited within me. He could be my way out of this mess. Great, I blurted out, unable to contain my excitement. He could actually help me with my situation. Leaning in, I lowered my voice, my gaze unwavering. I have an idea, I said, a sly smile playing on my lips. I'll forgive you for cheating on me with Alex if you help me meet him. Can you set it up? Emily was clearly caught off guard, confusion etched on her face. I realized she had no idea what was going on, and a wave of fear washed over her. Taking a deep breath, I recounted my harrowing experience with Ruth. As I spoke, I could see a mix of sympathy and guilt flicker in Emily's eyes. After a moment's hesitation, she nodded, agreeing to help me meet Alex. The following afternoon, I found myself nervously awaiting Alex's arrival at a quiet café nestled on a secluded side street. With time to spare, I excused myself to use the restroom. When I returned, my heart skipped a beat. Alex was seated opposite Emily, his eyes locked on mine in shock. As I approached the table, Alex's unease was palpable. He had only recently been intimate with Emily and seemed unsure how to react to my presence, especially with Emily sitting right there. Sensing the tension in the air, I decided to get straight to the point. Hi, Alex, or whatever your name is, I said, extending my hand for a handshake. I'm Jake, Emily's boyfriend. Alex's discomfort intensified as he shook my hand, a nervous smile plastered on his face. He seemed to be grappling with the awkwardness of the situation. I need your help, I continued, my voice steady. Before he could respond, I launched into my story. I have something to tell you, Alex, I began, my voice steady. I met a woman named Ruth on Tinder, and now, as a victim of her crimes, I've somehow become the prime suspect. If you want to keep your marriage intact, I paused, my gaze shifting to Emily. You need to help me, otherwise I'll tell your wife about your affair with Emily. Alex's face flushed with anger, then paled as the weight of my words sunk in. What do you want me to do? he asked, his voice barely a whisper. I'm sure I'm not her only victim, I replied. Dig deeper, Alex. Find out everything you can about Ruth. With a reluctant nod, he agreed. It was a small victory, but it was a start. The police searched the area surrounding Ruth's house in the forest. They spotted a pack of rats scurrying around some bushes, and beneath it they found a body, partially buried, badly decomposed, and wrapped in plastic. A post-mortem confirmed it was the corpse of a local man who'd disappeared six months earlier. I'd seen his mother crying on TV. There were holes in the crotch and left arm of his shrink-wrap prison where they believed a catheter and IV drip had been inserted, so Ruth could keep the poor guy alive, but in a state that prevented him from contaminating her perfect house. Ruth is denying any wrongdoing. Hopefully the prosecutors get their act together soon, although I'm told it could take a year before sentencing. The legal system can be slow, but justice will eventually prevail. We went back to the city, and I was relieved to have cleared my name, ironically thanks to Emily's lover. 
A few days passed in a haze of numbness and uncertainty. Then one evening I found Emily crying in the living room. Ah. What's going on? I asked, trying to keep my voice neutral. The body that Ruth killed, it's Alex, she replied, her voice breaking. Which Alex? The cop is still alive, I said, feeling a surge of anger and confusion. Come on, Jake, you don't need to be an asshole. Alex, my ex, she said, tears streaming down her face. Well, I can't say I'm sorry to hear that news, and sorry for that, I muttered, unable to hide the bitterness in my voice. You're being mean, Jake. It's not like I wanted to get back with Alex. It's just, I've known him, and it's sad that he got killed, she said, her sadness palpable. I understood that it was sad news, but I couldn't help myself. The betrayal still burned deep. I was hurt, sad, angry. All emotions tangled into a knot I couldn't untie. I didn't know if I could forgive her or if I even wanted to. Emily, I started, taking a deep breath. I get that you're sad about Alex. But this whole situation, everything that's happened, it's messed me up. You cheated on me, and I don't know how to move past that. She looked at me, her eyes red and swollen. I know, Jake. I messed up, and I'm so sorry. I never meant to hurt you like this. I believe you didn't mean to, but it doesn't change the fact that you did, I said, feeling the weight of my words. I don't know if I can forgive you. Not yet. Anyway. Silence hung between us, heavy and oppressive. Emily looked down, wiping her tears away. I understand. Take all the time you need. I'll be here, hoping we can work through this. I nodded, unsure of what the future held. The path ahead was uncertain and fraught with pain. But for now, I needed space to process everything, to heal from the wounds inflicted by betrayal and loss. As I walked away, I felt a mix of emotions, relief for having cleared my name, sorrow for the life lost, and a deep, aching sadness for the relationship that might never be the same again. The journey ahead would be long and difficult, but I hoped that in time we could both find a way to heal. Hit that subscribe button for more thrilling stories and unexpected twists. And what would you do if you were in Jake's shoes?